before Dave the, the one of the actually I was going to kind of mention in the very first uh, talk uh, it didn't really go to it too much because we uh, you know, we figured the morning to start according to the battle plan uh, but basically it's the mystery of the, the what we call it the negative mystery of tradition or the negative mystery of the faith not just a tradition. And the idea is that, why are we here? And it has to be said that a first practical reason why we're here is because there's something wrong where we're supposed to be. So, the normal situation is that as a Catholic, I am in my local Catholic parish. And I'm receiving the faith, living the faith, preparing to die in the faith, and spread the faith in the parish. And here the local parish, St. Benedict's, just a couple miles from here. And the this is our this is where we're supposed to live the faith. But there's a problem. Why are we called traditional Catholics and in our little chapels throughout the world, in the SSPX and the other independent chapels? We're not here purely for positive reasons. It actually begins with a negative reason. We're here because of a problem in the church. If the problem isn't there, then we don't need to be in a little hut in uh, Boston, Kentucky. We don't need to be in a Holiday Inn. We don't need to be even in a big chapel that was built without the permission of the diocese, where we have them throughout the world. We're here because of something negative. The bishop who's supposed to help me get to heaven, is helping us get to hell. The bishop, who is supposed to be communicating the Catholic faith, is not communicating it. He is, in fact, communicating confusion and modernism. Therefore, I have to step away from the bishop. Because he's endangering our souls. And that is how Catholic tradition began in the 1960s and 1969 1970. We should just be going to Latin Mass and teaching the Catholic faith along with every other Catholic. We should all be fighting the devil and modernism along with every other Catholic. But when the other Catholics, and particularly the ones in authority, reject the Catholic faith, therefore we have to stand apart. That is why when you go to someone, why are you going to the Latin Mass? Well, because the new Mass is bad. We don't just go to the Latin Mass because the Latin Mass is good. We also go to it because the new Mass is bad. If the new Mass was also good, and the Pope clearly wants us to go to the new Mass, and there's no doubt about that, and the Bishop wants us to go to the new Mass, and there's no doubt about that, we would have to go to it. The only reason we don't go there is because it's bad. Well, that's the principle, the negative mystery, the negative principle of Catholic tradition. We're here because there's something bad there. We want to be good, but we've got to fight the evil. And unfortunately, there's something evil amongst our fellow soldiers who are supposed to be wearing the same uniform that we do. That's the principle of Catholic tradition. Now, 40 years later, what do we discover? Why are we here in this Camp Crescendo? Why are we, you know, once again back at Holiday Inns? Why are we saying Mass in Winona? Or the people call us to go to Winona and we're saying Mass. I said the first Mass in Winona right across the hill from the seminary. This is Raider's house. And Forty people there. And, uh, you know, because that was the place we had to go to say the Mass. Why are we doing that? Because there's something wrong. So we need to understand what that something wrong is. Just like you have to explain in the overall battle of the Novo Soto versus the traditional, you've got to be able to explain what's wrong with the new Mass. What's wrong with the modernist teaching in the church today? Therefore, we must stand against it, and even if the bishop doesn't approve, we have to stand for the Catholic faith, even if they've got the churches, like St. Athanasius said, they have the church, we have the faith. Well, that principle is the true principle of the faith. It's always been true. It's also true today. So we've got to have an under we have to have an understanding what has gone wrong in the SSPX. What has gone wrong in the new modernist, modern direction, modernist direction of this tradition, and why we have to do what we're doing. In order to do that, we have to be able to show some of the things that are incorrect in the present 
hierarchy of society, show how it is against the faith and a danger to the faith, or a danger to the faith, either one, and therefore we have to resist. And so Father is going to go ahead and go through some examples and uh, give it to you. And one of the unfortunate things about Father Gruner not making it last night, Father Gruner was supposed to be here, he was also bringing with him 50 copies of this book. Well, since he didn't come, the 50 copies didn't come. So, uh, therefore, we're, we're going to try to find a way to make some copies anyway today to give to you. Uh, and uh, but uh, so the, the, the we have the lack of the priest and the lack of the copies. So we'll we'll, but we'll try to get that too. Which has some of these quotes. And Father, going to take over and go through some of the quotations. Sure. Yes. So we saw yesterday. It's not just rumor and cyber gossip. These errors that we're combating are right in the, from the documents, just like Vatican II and all the reforms came from the, the ambiguous documents of Vatican II, a Masonic tactic. So the ambiguity in the documents, which we saw the first one yesterday, which was the general chapter statement, Father well, Pfeiffer developed uh, the point on the, the, the paragraph that mentions, fails to mention the twofold magisterium, the mag two magisteria that, that we're dealing with now since the crisis. Anybody remember what they are? We're hearing now uh, the magisterium of the church, the church visible is the Catholic Church with the Pope, the bishops, the hierarchy. We, the SSPX, are not in union under the Pope, therefore we got to get back in to be Catholic. So if there's only one magisterium, that is Vatican II and in, in, in the light of tradition, then of course we're outside the church and we have to get back in. But where's the failure of distinction? What's the distinction the Archbishop Lefebvre always gave? Anybody remember? Just think of the first paragraph of the 1974 Declaration. We cleave with all our heart to eternal. eternal Rome, Catholic Rome of all time. That's what we are. If you have the faith, you're not outside the church. Was St. Athanasius outside the church when he was excommunicated by Pope Liberius? No. It was an unjust, unlawful, null and void. As so the eternal Rome, we adhere with all our heart to eternal Rome and we refuse modernist Rome. Rome, the conciliar Rome. So Father Pfeiffer developed that yesterday. So that's in the general chapter statement. The, uh, the error of the only one magisterium. when we're dealing with two. And the Archbishop was very clear about this. And that's why uh, Father Ortiz has a great nine points, which all of you should really look into and read carefully, as he develops this quite well. That the visible, you know, we're not visibly under the Pope, but we're under the Pope of tradition. As soon as this Pope comes back to tradition, or the next one, or the next one, there won't even need to be an agreement. We fall right in, because he'll have the faith, we have the faith, no problem. But as long as he does not hold the, the Catholic faith, the tradition, we cannot. Like, we recognize him as Pope, obviously, but we cannot follow him in, into error. We will lose our faith, lose our souls. Second thing we saw was the six conditions. saw that briefly yesterday, and we'll try to get a copy of that to you. It is, it is, it is studied in depth in this book, it's this Operation Suicide. It's a very good book because it's, it's all the documents. Because one of the attacks against the resistance is, oh, you're all just based on gossip and rumor and, and misinterpreting and exaggerating Bishop Fillet's mistakes. But here, this is, this is cold, cold beef, potatoes, and wine. 
There's not much sugar. It's just the cold documents, right from Bishop Fillet, right from Rome, right from Archbishop Lefebvre, right from Bishop Galleretta. And uh, it's very, very good. And it's, it's just... So what I'd like to cover with this, and Father Feinberg will probably pop in too sometime, is, uh, is some of the objections. So we saw the general chapter statement. It's, it's really in the documents, this change of doctrine, this change of position towards Rome. And it's not rumor, it's really there. Anybody remember the sentence, the deadly sentence in here? We hope so. We approve, we determine and approve with the essential conditions, the eventual canonical agreement, the canonical normalization is the exact word, which is the same as practical agreement, uh, legalization, recognition, or canonical normalization. So that's right in the text. The six conditions uh, we saw yesterday are very flimsy. Uh, being willing to put all our houses, our brothers, sisters, priests, and faithful under the local diocesan bishop. Uh, the, remember the Redemptorists from Scotland? Remember their great paper, the Catholic, that went all over the world? And they used to come and give missions. They didn't have to I'll call up the Bishop of Spokane to ask permission to give a a mission at Post Falls. And these missions were fruitful. They, they preached, you know, the, the style of St. Alphonsus Liguri. And they were, they were very fruitful. <coughs> well, when they made the agreement with Rome, their, 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 high, their um, straight jacketed and duct taped. And now, this last August, 15th, they came under the local diocesan bishop. They were put under the bishop. So all their battle for Catholic tradition has all been compromised because they made the agreement with Rome. So now they have legalization, but what are they doing for the kingship of Christ? What are they doing for the salvation of souls now? So this is the traps. These are the traps that are built into this and this is what we, the, the you, what, why the resistance is rising, why we have to resist, is all these are just, it's just all losing your faith legally. It's, it's like a legal apostasy. Um, and one thing at the, at the foundation of all these, you, we always got to keep in mind, this is the heart of the fight right here. The Holy Roman Catholic faith. What is the faith? What is the faith? Is it an internal feeling? As Bishop Williamson used to say, he used to call them NIFs, N-I-F. A nice internal feeling. Is that what the faith is? That is the modernist definition of the faith. And Archbishop Lefebvre described in Father Dorman's book, with Pope John Paul II, and the same as with, with this pope, they really believe the Blessed Trinity developed later, the doctrine on the Blessed Trinity, and only a couple centuries <coughs> after Christ. And it, because it, it fit the need for Christianity. And the, the doctrines of the faith just come from the internal. So if this Pope, in all his modernism, really believes, as the Vatican II says, that all the different rel religions are different expressions of the same Holy Spirit, then it's easy to make sense. Then, to what Catholic tradition in the, the super ecumenical church makes sense? It makes sense that he wants us back in. Because we uh, in the modernist way of thinking, you have the thesis and antithesis. You have the Hegelian um, dialectic. So the ultra-progressives push for you know, altar girls and communion in the hand, and the ultra-conservatives, the traditional Catholics, 
don't want to move that way, and they want to keep tradition. So in the modernist framework, as St. Pius X well described in Pashendi, they see this as necessary to bring about the clash which develops into a new, for example, a perfect example, which we're on the verge of right now. You got the progressives who want the, the new mass. That can't be new enough. You got the traditionalists who don't want to change the mass. But this necessary conflict brings out what's going to come out this summer under this pope, the hybrid mass, which is the, the union of the traditional mass and the new mass. And it's going to bring up this new and wonderful development of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> and that's deadly. So uh, we always got to come back to this. What is the faith? What unites us to Christ? It's the faith of, of all time, which doesn't come from inside. The faith is the submission of the intellect prompted by grace, the will moved by grace submitting to what God has revealed. That's the faith. And it is unity in the same doctrine. It is the true unity. Unity in, in, in belief, or the expression of the faith. Unity in the government and the Pope. Unity in the same sacrifice of the Mass. And unity in the seven sacraments. And that is the, what is, that's the definition of the Catechism of the Church. The unity of the believers in the faith. The Catholic faith of, of tradition based on revelation. So all this push for unity with modernist Rome, does Rome today have the same doctrine and the same faith? Is this pope promoting the same traditional Catholic faith of all time? You tell me. No. That's easy. That's a mockery to the first commandment. And there's a, there's a whole list in all his heretical books that he wrote as a priest are still being pushed, printed, and taught in modernist seminaries. Has he recanted them? Has he burned them all? No. Yes? Um, I have a question about the hybrid mass. Is this mass, what place is this mass going to have? Is it possible that they will put away the ordinary form of the mass and the extraordinary form of the mass and replace it completely with this hybrid mass? We'll see. I mean, you never know what the modernists are capable of. But this might be called the superordinary mass. Because <laughs> it, <laughs> it, 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 seems like it's, it seems like with just that fact that they're going to bring out another mass, that could be yet another huge, well, it already will be, but it could be even a bigger threat than a lot of people think yeah. to the SSBX True. joining with, True. with Rome. And many think, most will think it's a great thing. It's combining both worlds and... I think Benedict XVI thinks that it was a mistake to so quickly do the Notus Ordo. So his idea is incremental change. So yes, that's true. You'll probably see the 62 missile incrementally changed, and then we've seen some incremental change in the Notus Ordo. And then over time, over maybe 20 years, then there'll be a okay. little difference between yes. There was an article in Catholic Family News that talked about the hybrid mass, and. And it talked about uh, the, the Pope say, stating that if they started all over again, they would have changed the Mass over 20 years. Yes. And the, the slowness would have gotten it all, kept it all together. Okay. Yeah, that's another, that's another thing behind this. These principles have changed in the general chapter in six conditions. And to see that. But in fact, a revolution has taken place which is shifting from doctrine first, the faith first, over unity, to unity over faith. And this is what we're covering now. Are we united with Rome in doctrine and the faith? Well, when Rome and the Pope speak traditionally, of course. But when they're speaking as modernists, we must refuse. Uh, the government, well, we reckon we're under the same Pope, visible head. But we reject his errors, and we cannot follow him. It's like the president is president. He's a so-and-so. We all know that. 
but he's still president. So we acknowledge his authority, but we can't follow him in his uh, perversion. Are we united with Rome in the same sacrifice? Does Rome have the same sacrifice as an ass? Modernist Rome? Absolutely not. So how can there, and sacraments, do we have the sacrament of reconciliation? Are you going to sit down with Father Pfeiffer face to face and discuss your sins? No, you, you kneel down as a penitent. That's what confession is. You go to the sacred heart of Jesus and you accuse yourself. So they have gutted out the meanings of the sacraments. As Pius X said, they would keep the same love label on the pill bottle, but fill it with a different poisonous content. Mm. So I ask you, are we united with Rome, modernist Rome, in any of these? Other than the distinctions we just made. We're not. So how can there be a practical agreement with men who don't even hold these, and not only just don't hold them, they're positively destroying and wrecking the mass, the sacraments, the faith. <coughs> and positively, most bishops in the world, they, they don't have the faith. They don't even have it. And priests, there are many that do. In spite of Navasoy, in spite of the modernist Rome. But as a whole, modernist Rome, this is why Archbishop of France said there can never be a practical agreement unless it's built on the true faith and tradition, the Catholic faith of all time. And that's what we got to have clearly in our minds. No agreement unless, until Rome converts to tradition. Uh, re, re, see. Review the great 1988 consecration sermon. You can look that up, the 1988 consecration sermon of Archbishop of Fed. You can see it live and hear the translation. And uh, three times in that sermon he says it. We will, we will, we refuse these any agreement with Rome until Rome comes back to tradition. Three times, and he's three people. Al nauseam, really. So let's cover a few objections. One of them comes up quite often, and it's very deceiving. And that is, um, but Archbishop Lefebvre, he signed most of the documents of Vatican II. So what's wrong? What's wrong with Bishop Filetti saying 95% of Vatican II is acceptable, since Archbishop Lefebvre said, well, it's not all, you know, not all the documents are bad. He said that in the 60s, Archbishop of Fair. He said it even in the 70s. So what's wrong with, you know, the society working out these surmountable obstacles to an agreement with Rome that Vatican II can be dealt with and just see everything in the light of tradition? And the answer to that is, as one of our fellow priests in the resistance made a very good point, um, let's just take a you know a ninth grade wrestler. You know he's wrestling in ninth grade. He he develops. Tenth grade he gets better. He learns more moves. Eleventh grade he learns the moves of his enemies. And by twelfth grade he's ready to graduate into better wrestling. Let's just say, Archbishop of wrestled with. The modernists, the beasts, Cardinal Ratzinger, Cardinal Casaroli, Pope John Paul II, he, he dealt with them face to face. And in wrestling with this slick dragon, he learned by the end of his life in his last conference, 1990, he has a great conference which is available, it's out there, and uh, it's called <coughs> It's called Two Years After the Consecration. Two years after. <coughs> Two years after the Consecration. Now, he will die in 91, March 25th, a significant date. But this is even less than a year before he dies. Here's what he says. 
It's very important to, to bring this back to people who always say, well, Archbishop of Fab accepted part of the council. He said, he said later in his life, he said, the more I study the documents of Vatican II, the more I, he, here's his words, and these words were actually quoted to Bishop Follet by the three bishops. Here he says, the more one analyzes the documents of Vatican II and their interpretation by the authorities of the church, including this pope, and the more one realizes that they are neither superficial errors, Now, open brackets, this is not in here, but superficial errors, I don't know if you've been following, but that's been a lot on those SSPX website. That this Giardini, this new, this new uh, critique on Vatican II, he calls it superficial errors. And that's become the society's new attack on Vatican II, that it's just superficial errors. But it's not, here's Archbishop Lefebvre saying it's not just superficial. <laughs> 